It is indeed a real honor to be here in Conway with you and see this place just completely packed tonight with people that are uh, here to seek after the Lord. You didn't come to see me, hear me, anything. You really came to be in the presence of God. I'm going to facilitate tonight and just, I'm a trainer, I'm a coach, I'm, 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 I'm not a big deal. I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. In fact, I told Pastor Rick, this is my fifth sermon to preach since yesterday morning here. And if I have to preach anymore, I'm going to have to start making stuff up now. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> But Rick has, has, has really blessed me to see his desire to move deeper into this as a church. And uh, sometimes, you know, they can't find anybody to preach much on these topics. That's why I'm here. And, and so, uh, but I just love uh, Rick and Michelle. We had lunch, Rick and I did today, and we couldn't get out of the restaurant. Every table, somebody was calling his name, and he was stopping, and he was ministering and cutting up. If you know Rick, you know, he kind of likes to laugh a little bit. Have you noticed that? And just what a blessing, but he and Michelle, I love the two of you. I, I just, I told Melanie, what a tremendous blessing the two of you are. Your family, all serving the Lord here, the community. You know, when, I, when, when you told me you were headed to Conway 17 years ago, you know, who would have known, brother? We went to three campuses today, and just what God is doing through you. So I just wanted to tell you guys, thank you, and I love you. I love you so much. Let's give them a hand clap. They're a blessing. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, well, let's get started, you know. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you tonight, uh, Lord, because you help us to understand our enemy, and you want us to conquer our enemy because you already defeated him. And I thank you tonight, Lord, you're opening the eyes of our understanding to know how to win the battles that we're all going through. I pray your word would become rich and real and that every person here, the Holy Spirit, would open their eyes of their understanding. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I want to read a scripture verse from 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, and I'm just I'm going to read only a short little clip of it. I, I don't think I've ever preached on spiritual warfare until this year out of this verse. I preached a lot on it through the years. But this is the verse that, that sort of stuck with me uh, this year from 1 Timothy 1. Paul was talking to his protege, Timothy, and he was teaching him about spiritual warfare. And he told him, you have a couple of guys in the church, Hymenaeus and Alexander, they've gotten into false doctrine. And he said, the devil has deceived them. But he said, I want you, he said in this verse, I charge you, Timothy, my child, that's what he called him, he was his spiritual son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Notice that, prophecies, by them we wage the good warfare. And then he gave us a third phrase, holding faith and a good conscience. Now I want to stop right there, because in one verse we see sort of the, the, the three important things about spiritual warfare. I can find all three of them in the same verse. And the first one that I noticed is the word prophecies. And I know for a lot of people, they don't understand anything about prophecy. You know, a lot of the churches I know are nonprofit organizations. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, you'll get that tomorrow. <laughs> but prophecies were in the Old Testament. Prophets would speak and the Lord would back their word. And I'm going to deal in a moment with prophecies as being your weapons and actually the gifts of the Spirit. Prophecy is one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So he's saying here, the gifts of the Spirit are our weapons. And the second thing I notice, he says that by them you would wage the good warfare. Warfare. And if you have a blank right there by the word warfare, put the word strategy. Prophecies refers to our weapons. Weapons. There are weapons in the spirit world. Warfare, the word warfare refers to our strategy. And I'm going to mention this, and then I'll get back to it in the message again, that 
the word warfare is a long-term word. And another part of 1 Timothy, he said, fight the fight of faith, the good fight of faith. That means a short-term battle, a fist fight. But this word warfare is a different word. It's a long-term campaign. Because actually, spiritual warfare is not a firecracker. It's not a little, a little fist fight you make up and all. It's a, it's a long-term campaign. And the last word he uses, he says, holding faith and a good conscience. So that speaks to me of your protection or your armor. Put that in the blank. Your armor. So in one verse... I've seen, number one, prophecy mentioned, which is a gift of the Spirit, one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. I've seen the word warfare mentioned, which is our strategy, and I'll teach on that in a minute. And then I've seen the word armor, or I've seen the word conscience, and to me, that has to do with our armor. Okay, let's back up to the first one, weapons. You know, right now, one of the biggest things going on in military activity is stealth. Everything's about stealth. And there's a plane that flies at 80,000 feet, which is suborbital almost. And it's it's there now. You don't see it, but it sees you. It's it's invisible. They're even trying to make a certain type of a clothing or a cape that can render a person almost invisible. It uses all types of refraction, though they'll never make a person visible, but they can cloak a person. And they're thinking of that on the battlefield, that they can actually cloak a soldier in something that renders them almost invisible. In fact, the, the word for warfare in the 21st century is stealth, everything. Flying under the radar, flying above the radar. Then we got satellites circling the world. And you say, well, you know, what's a satellite? Where is that? Well, go to Google Earth. And look at your home online. They can see your swimming pool on the, in the backyard from a satellite. And so my grandmother would not vaccinate my dad and them back in the 1930s. They wanted to vaccinate them. She said, I don't believe in vaccination. They said, well, she said, why do we need to do that? They said, well, it's because of germs. She said, I've never seen a germ. I don't need to vaccinate my kids. <laughs> I had a friend that was a Golden Gloves a competitor uh, comp- in, in Louisiana, I think he won. I, I'm not quite sure about that, but I know he was in the competition and he was getting beaten really bad. He's a good friend of Pastor Rick and mine. And uh, the guy has, was just killing him. I mean, his nose was bleeding, his ears were bleeding he, and his head was swollen. And he goes to the corner during the bell and his coach was trying to kind of encourage him. And he said, he said champ, get back in there. He hadn't laid a glove on you yet. Well, this guy's bleeding everywhere. He can barely talk. His lips are all poked out. And he he just turns to the the coach and he said, would you please keep your eye on the referee then? Because I'm getting hit from somewhere. (laughs) Isn't that the way it is? If you don't know the reality of Satan's attack in your life, you keep blaming people for what the enemy is doing. He's flying stealth. He's, he's flying orbitally. He's, he's, and the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual wickedness and principalities in high places, heavenly places. So get the, get the 35,000 foot view here tonight of prayer. Last night I talked about patterns of prayer, like the Lord's Prayer, Tabernacle Prayer, Trinity Prayer, various Jabez Prayer. But tonight, I'm going to move to the other side of the coin because this last night was about how you draw close to God, those patterns of prayer. But James said, draw close to God, and then he said, resist the devil and he will flee from you in the same verse. So a lot of people, they, they may, they, okay, I'm going to do the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to get real close to God. That's good. You need to do that. I did that today. I prayed the Lord's Prayer this morning and uh, topically and the Tabernacle Prayer this morning in my hotel. But then there's times that if I don't understand the flip side of prayer is resist the devil and he will flee from you. Well, I'm getting slapped upside the head and I don't know where it's coming from and I blame you. Hey, why did you hit me? I didn't hit you. And so let me talk to you about this and let's start with the word weapons. I'm going to give you my top three weapons. Now I've been preaching this year for 50 years. 
May of, of this year, I'll be 66. I preached my first sermon when I was 16. Ten minutes long, baby, all I knew. <laughs> and it's 50 years this year. I'm excited about that. That done all right. A little golf clap. That's fine. But, so I've gone through a lot of stuff. I was a missionary in Africa two years. when I, I was married two weeks when I left for Africa with my bride, Melanie, on a missions trip. I was going to be there six weeks. I ended up staying almost 18 months in Africa. And let me tell you, that's where I learned the reality of spiritual warfare. We don't deal here in America a lot with what people do in many countries of the world where the light of the gospel is very dim. But let me just, let me just start off by saying, here's my top three things. When I have a spiritual battle, and many of you are in a spiritual battle tonight, we're going to pray at the end of this session. We're going to come against anything that is trying to destroy you, defeat you, your marriage, your business, your health, your kids, so many things that happen. And in the 50 years I've been preaching, I've just had so many battles and so many issues that I've been through. But only three things is what's brought me through. The first one has been the spoken word of God. The spoken word of God. I love to read the word. I really do. I enjoy reading. I read today. I did my readings in the, in, in the Bible that I do every day. But I'm not just talking about reading now. There's two words for the word word. <laughs> That's a funny sentence. In the Bible. First, there's the word logos, which is like the Bible. Then there's the word rhema, which is like a spoken word. It's two completely different words for the word word. And the rhema is the spoken word. It's the word in your mouth. The logos is the word on the page or your iPad or whatever it is that you're reading it out of tonight. But the, but the rhema word is the spoken word. So when we deal with the devil, it isn't about what's in your book, in your Bible, because we have 13 copies of it at home with dust on them. The devil's not worried about that. What he's worried about is when you get in the word and you stop for a moment and get a promise and start speaking that word because that is your weapon, is the word of God. Can I have an amen to that? I had a friend that was going through a real physical battle and one day he just decided he was going to read the Bible to the devil and he just said, devil, listen to this. And he started... He started reading scripture about healing, and within about 15 minutes, he was completely healed. The devil had enough. He had to head out because he doesn't like the spoken word. The second thing that I've used uh, often in spiritual warfare is prayer and fasting. Now, that's what we're in this week. We're in a season of prayer and fasting. There are many forms of fasting. You know that. There's water only which I've done that before. I look like a refugee from a concentration camp after I finished. And then there's, you know, some people just fast broccoli. That's good. That's cool. Whatever. In fact, I've decided that my fasting is anything that, that'll come up a straw. Come on now. So if I can puree a steak, that counts as fasting. But whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Rick and I, you know, we're doing vegetables and you know, Daniel fast and and, and there's many ways. But if you really study scripture like Daniel chapter 10, you see that he prayed about something for 21 days and didn't get an answer. And finally, an angel showed up. Read it in Daniel chapter 10 and said from the very first day, everybody say the first day. First day. That would have been Monday of this week. From the first day that you started praying and fasting, your prayer was heard and I was sent with the answer. That's what the angel told Daniel from the first day. And yet he didn't see or hear any answer for 21 days. So then he said, I have been in a battle with the principality over Persia. See, demonic spirits nest and rule over countries. And the angel of the Lord, Daniel 10, said, I've been in a battle. And he said, Michael, another archangel, came and helped me. And I have now made it here on the 21st day. But the answer was already there. And you see, you've been praying about something. And you, first of all, you thought God didn't hear you. Well, you first thought he didn't care. But he does. And then you thought God didn't hear you. But he has. He's already sent the answer. 
I'm encouraging you that in praying and fasting, you're empowering the messengers that are bringing your answer into your situation. And of course, the devil said, well, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that because the power of God is released through prayer and fasting. My third weapon that I've used, and this is the one I really, really, really would like to impart to you tonight, is knowledge. Revelation, knowledge. I'm talking to you about the weapons that work. I've done this, I've done this for many years, 50 years. And now I'm telling you the things that work. The first thing that works is when I get a scripture that I start beating the devil over the head with every day. You read this devil, you see that promise, you see that, you got to leave my family. You got to leave my life. You got to leave my business. You have to leave my home. And I just don't let up on him. And finally he gets enough of it and he leaves. And the second thing is when I start fasting, I feel an intensity of power against the enemy in my own spirit and it just brings great breakthrough but this last one now 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 i'm going to communicate something important to you about warfare warfare is about knowledge you know if i'm if i'm fighting a guy and and i really think he's amazing he's huge he's he looks like he's just incredible and and all that But then I discover that he can't see. Or I discover something about him that that I that I get knowledge that his bark is is all bark. There's no bite. It changes the battle plan. The knowledge. If someone told me that I can't vote. I'd say, well, you know what? You got to me too late. I know I can vote. I'm a citizen of the United States. I know who I am. Knowledge, knowledge is power. Not, not huffing and puffing. I see people try to deal with the devil, and they think they have to act all ruthless and big and bad and ugly. You don't. You can relax. The battle is already won. It's already won. The Lord told Jehoshaphat, you don't need to fight in this battle. The Lord will fight the battle. The devil is already defeated. And you say, well, how do you figure that? Okay, go, go with me through the epistles for a moment and notice something. This is knowledge. I'm giving you knowledge. So you're going to calm down. When the devil attacks you, you're going to go, oh, is that you again? Get out of my way. Because you have knowledge. It's like a, like a dog that, you know, he, grow, he barks, bark, 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 and then you notice he doesn't have any teeth. It's like, oh, you silly dog. <laughs> now, that's knowledge. Knowledge changes everything. And here's the knowledge I have. When Christ was crucified, the Bible says, I am crucified with Christ. In God's mind, I am as dead to sin as he was when he died on the cross. I and Christ are one on the cross in the mind of God. And then it says I'm buried with Christ by baptism. That word with is like Siamese twins. If you look at Siamese twins, they have two heads but one body. That's the word in Greek for being buried with Christ. It's Siamese twins. You and Christ. Whatever he did is as if you did it. Are you with me? But not only was he crucified and buried, but he also went into the lower parts of the earth and defeated the devil and took the keys of hell and death. A friend of mine said he knocked the devil on top of the head so hard that his toenails went up and down like piano keys. That's right. That's a good Louisiana phrase right there. But not only did Jesus defeat the devil, but he rose. And the Bible says, I'm risen with Christ. Can I go one more step? It says that he ascended and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And the Bible says, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all principalities. So your problem is you're fighting the devil from earth when in actuality you're seated with Christ in heaven. You think the devil, you think Jesus is chewing his fingernails about what the devil's up to on earth? He's not. He's already defeated him. I'm giving you good news tonight, Conway Campus, and anybody online, you've already defeated the devil in Christ. 
I'm going to let it soak in on you a minute. I'm not going to move past that because that's your problem. You're fighting it yourself. You're trying to huff and puff and blow the devil's house down. He's already defeated. And that knowledge changed my life. Because when the enemy shows up, I just say, oh, you again. I don't have to shout, yell, lose control. I just stand. Paul said, having done all to stand, stand, therefore. I just stand. So the enemy is under your foot. It might do you good just to go ahead and just put your foot on him and remind him that he's under your foot. That's good. I like that. That's a noise he doesn't like. And that's knowledge. See, churches don't teach this to people. They think, they, they, they say, don't talk about the devil because he might get mad at you. He's already mad at you. <laughs> Look, you either going to win or you're going to lose. I heard a story about a bully on the playground. And all he kept was a big legal pad. And one day a little skinny kid like me, I, I, I look, I was ridiculously skinny as a kid. This little skinny kid walked over to this big old bully and looked over on his pad. He said, what you got there? He said, this is a list of all the names of the people that I can whip on this playground. And the little guy looked on that list and he saw his name. And he backed up and he said, you can't whip me. Come on, I'll take you right now. And that bully turned his pencil over and just erased that guy's name. That's you. That's you. I love that verse in Acts 19 where the demons came out of that man and the demons said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? Because these people didn't know Christ. When you get Christ in your life, you and Christ are one. The devil is not just dealing with Christ now. He's dealing with Christ in you. And when you show up, every demon in that room gets very nervous. Y'all are looking at me like a cow in a new gate. <laughs> Come on, back row. Am I helping you back there? Am I helping anybody? I'm telling you, knowledge is the whole deal. Why didn't somebody tell me that? So it's the spoken word that helped me in a huge way when I realized I got to get it off the page. I got to get it in my mouth. The spoken word, so powerful. The second thing was prayer and fasting. That changed everything too. And then the last thing was when I got some knowledge about what was belonging to me in Christ. Now here's the second word is strategy. We got the weapons now, okay? We got the weapons, the three weapons I just gave you. Now we come to strategy. This is gonna help you so much because strategy in spiritual warfare the first word I'm going to give you is patience. Put that in the blank. The strategy of spiritual warfare is outlasting the devil. Because he does not move just because you rebuke him. You will rebuke till you wear your rebuker out. And he will still be sitting there. See, I discovered something about the end. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Okay. But he takes a couple of naps along the way before he leaves. I'm going to encourage you that if you have been trying to resist the enemy and get him off your property, off your home, off your business, out of your life, out of your body, and nothing's happening, join the crowd. This is our strategy is patience. You know, I have a son that's been on dialysis now 24 years. I talked to him this afternoon. He's in the ministry. Joel, what a blessing. And we've been up against this thing for 24 years. But can I tell you, God has miraculously touched Joel. Joel is preaching everywhere. He's, it, it's just, it's an absolute miracle. I haven't won the war yet, but I'm winning the daily battle every day against the enemy. You know, there was a war in Iberia. That's in Europe. You know how long that war lasted? 781 years. This war we've been in has been going on 6,000 years. 
It ain't going to change by Saturday. <laughs> You're going to go through some things. We're all going to do. I'm encouraging you. You're not odd if you're facing a battle. Hello. It, it's normal. This is normal stuff. And I like this verse, 2 Samuel 3, 1. There was a long war. Everybody say long war. There was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger and Saul became weaker and weaker. This is what I've learned about spiritual warfare. You, you use the word of God and you speak it against the enemy and you do it every day until he leaves. And then you have prayer and fasting seasons like this. And then you have revelation knowledge. And the more you know of who you are in Christ, the stronger you are against the devil. But this thing can take a while. Sometimes it's instant. I've seen people be instantly healed. I've seen people be instantly delivered. I've seen many, many things. And then there's sometimes the devil just sits there and he just folds his arms and says, can I outlast you? That's the whole name of the game. So the strategy is patience. And the Lord, it says in this verse, the Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. I'm kind of convinced God allows that to happen because if we didn't have any battles and all we had to do just snap our finger and everything was fine, we could hardly even live with you. You'd be so bad. So God's dealing with our character and allowing that to happen. You know, my daddy was colorblind. And in World War II, what they did with daddy was put him up in planes in North Africa and fly him over the fields where the Germans were hiding their artillery in North Africa under camouflage nets and all that. Well, daddy was colorblind. So when he looked down from the, from the vantage point he was, red was green and green was red. He could see where the weapons were being stored because of his vision problem. Now that's my second word I'm gonna give you about strategy. First is patience and second is discernment. Discernment. Our strategy is to ask the Holy Spirit to show us what kind of demonic power we are dealing with and what about our lives has given access to that thing. That's discernment. That's one of the gifts of the Spirit, discerning of spirits. And the Bible says we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Wars are won by intelligence. You know, I remember Daddy, he fought in World War II. He told me when Pearl Harbor went down, and as you remember, the general, our general, MacArthur, was brought, brought in to take the place of the general that allowed Pearl Harbor, and they thought he would fire everyone, and he didn't. Instead of firing everyone, he kept everyone, and within two months, one of the men he kept on staff cracked the code of the Japanese army. In World War II, we basically had the code of the Japanese army for several years. And what they would do is they would take the, the codes that were coming, the secret codes. And I remember in one case, one of the generals was flying from Japan to uh, Singapore. And they cracked the code and we went and shot him out of the sky. They didn't know how we did it. Midway, we, we won that battle because we had cracked the code. Intelligence wins wars. You have to know what it is that you're dealing with. That might be the type of spirit that you're dealing with. When Jesus cast out the demons from the man that, that had 6,000 demons. You remember that story? He crossed the lake and he came and there was this man came running out full of demons. And he said, what is your name? The man said, my name is Legion for we are many. And a legion is 6,000. He had 6,000 demons that fit in one human body. Can you believe that? And so the Lord cast those demons into the pigs. I've been to that hillside in, in, in the Holy Land. I've seen that place where that happened. He cast those, de those demons and they went into pigs. Demons looked for a body to live in. And they ran down the bank and they all drowned themselves in the sea. Somebody said they made the first deviled ham. Have you ever heard that before? Anyway. <laughs> but notice, he asked this man, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion for we are many. This is, this is discernment. And I learned when I'm dealing with demonic spirits, particularly in missions around the world, 
I have to discover where this person gave access to that problem. And that's how I get more results. So the first thing I taught you is our weapons. Now I've taught you our strategy is patience. Our strategy is discernment. But let me come to the last word that Paul used in his verse. He said, holding faith and a good conscience. I love this last one. Holding faith and a good conscience. That's our protection. Our protection or our armor is our faith and our conscience. Let me explain that to you. You know, in Ephesians 6, he talks about the shield of faith. Say that word faith. Do you know the shield in the Roman army was not a little old thing that you kind of hid behind? You know how big? It was the size of the front door of your house, eight feet tall. It was a serious shield. And not only was that shield huge, but it could interlock with the other shields. Sixteen men fought together in the Roman army. Sixteen. And they could defend about a half acre of ground, 16 men. That's how they they won the world. That's how they took over the world. It was the little squad of 16 men and their shields interlocked. So if they were taking a city and they came up against the wall and they were dropping boulders and, and shooting arrows, they locked their shields together and it was like a turtle shell then. They could all kind of exist underneath this protection. Well, the stupidest thing you could do if you're being rained down with arrows and your your eight foot door type shields are all locked together and you're under there. The stupidest thing you could do is stick your silly little head out the side (laughs) to see what's up. That's about the dumbest thing you can do. All you got to do is stay behind the shield. You're going to be okay. And that's the word Paul used. He called it the shield of faith. You know, the opposite of faith is fear. If you are afraid tonight that the enemy's going to kill you. I dealt with a man today. He told me his, his dad died at about 50 and his mother died at 49 and his sister died at 52. And he's about that age. And, he, and I said, yeah, what do you think? You think you're about to die? See, the enemy will do anything he can to get your little head out from behind the shield. But you stay down under the shield of faith. You say, you know what? It quenches the fiery darts of the evil one. So your protection is that you do not allow fear to come in your life. Tell your neighbor, I think he's talking to you. Some of you are scared of your shadow. And the more news you listen to, you'd think everything's going to happen. It's not. And here's my second. I'm going to show you. This is how you defend yourself. First, you stay behind the shield. Secondly, it has to deal with your conscience. Your conscience is your protection. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. The conscience is where guilt and shame and condemnation can live. If you want to know how you protect yourself against the devil, you cannot have guilt in your life. And by the way, the devil's an expert at telling you how terrible you are. He's called the accuser of the brethren. He'll never congratulate you on being a good Christian, ever. All he's going to do is condemn you the rest of your life. He's going to say, well, see there. You see what you just did? You just, you see, you just lied. You see, you're not a Christian. And he, his, whole, his whole game, and I hear Christians all the time. Lord, I call them to pray. They say, Lord, forgive us of our many sins. That's sort of a standard thing for Christians. I don't pray that way. That's almost a slap in God's face. Did he forgive me or did he not? I can't hear you. Has he forgiven us or did he not forgive us? We sang about the blood tonight. That's what overcomes the devil is the blood because it's the blood that gives our conscience a clear, clean feeling. And that's when we stand up on our hind legs and tell the devil, 
to get out of our way because our conscience is clean. Now, I don't know where you stand in your spiritual life. Maybe you, you know, you, you had a bad marriage or you had an abortion or you had, you had a criminal record. You have, who, who of us in this room doesn't have things they're very ashamed of in our past? But if you can let the blood of Jesus Christ and the scripture talks about the helmet of salvation. I'm saved. I'm, I'm saved. I'm right with God. My name's in heaven. It talks about the breastplate of righteousness over your heart. I, I, well, God loves me. I'm saved. I'm right with God. I'm 100% forgiven. My name is written in heaven. I'm on my way. If I die tonight, I'm ready. You know, my death day is my birthday in heaven. I'm ready. I got the, and then he says, a girdle of truth. The belt of truth, I, I, I have integrity because of God. I, I tell the truth now. And the shoes of peace, so you don't have fear. Well, that's your armor. It's faith and your conscience being clear. And here's my last verse I want to give you. 1 John 3 and 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. You know, the devil didn't even want you to come to this service tonight. He told you, well, you're too tired after work. You don't need to go over to that church tonight because he didn't want you to hear what I'm telling you. Number one is that you have three weapons. The spoken word. You have prayer and fasting. And then you have knowledge. That's your weapons. Number two is that you have two strategies in dealing with the devil. Number one is patience. You're going to wait him out. He's defeated. He's going to figure that out. And he's got to leave. And he's going to leave permanently. You have patience as your strategy. And then you also have, after patience, discernment. You can see his plots and his strategy. And thirdly, I'm teaching you tonight that your protection is faith and not fear. And a clean conscience and not condemnation. How many of you would say it feels good to be forgiven? Raise up your hand if you'd say that. Doesn't it feel good to be forgiven? And here's what we're going to do. Let's, let's, let's take just a moment and bow our heads. I'm going to pray for you in a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm not through. Who in this room would say to me, Pastor, I'm having an issue with my conscience. I've got things that are going on. You can keep your hands down. Let me explain. I've got things in my past that I have shame, guilt, and inferiority about. Even to be in this church tonight, I feel a sense of, of shame, guilt, and inferiority. That's me. That's an issue in my life. And tonight, I would love to be set free from that. Now, no one's looking, but if that's you, just raise up your hand right where you're sitting. Okay. Many, many hands going up in this room. Why don't you just go ahead and put that hand over your heart? Why don't you just do that? I just told you that your conscience is your protection. That's your protection. Let's get that conscience clean. Could everyone say this prayer with me out loud and you online? Let's all say this. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for the cross where Jesus shed his blood. Sprinkle that blood upon my heart, upon my mind, and upon my body. Wash me clean, as white as the driven snow, and write my name in the book of life. I thank you, Lord. Would you do something else for me? Do what Paul told us to do. He said to lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. You're not going to doubt now who you are. I want you to just lift up your hands and just begin to thank the Lord for a clean conscience. Go ahead, please. Please just do that from the front to the back. 
just thank him. Make an altar right there in your seat. Nobody's looking at you. Nobody's bothered about you. It's just between you and God. Thank him for a conscience that is clean and pure. That's why I came to Little Rock was this last message to get you where you really know who you are in Christ. Thank him that you were crucified with Christ. Thank him that you were buried with Christ, that you defeated the devil with Christ, that you raised with Christ and ascended with Christ, and that you're seated with Christ in heaven. Father, give a revelation to the people in this church of who they are in Christ. Give them knowledge that gives them power and gives them authority. Let them not be worried about the enemy. Let them thank you right now. Go ahead with your hands raised and just say, thank you, Lord, for who I am in Christ. Thank you for my inheritance. Thank you for what belongs to me, Lord. You're so good. Your grace and mercy is so kind. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. What a wonderful prayer. Let's clap our hands and thank the Lord for that. Thank you, Lord. And we got about, we got about three more minutes, and just, just here's what I want to do now. I got to get your conscience clean like we just did. Now we are going to put up the shield of faith. And we're going to agree with you. and We're going to take authority over the enemy. Just like some dog that was trying to come on your property. And you're holding a shotgun or a BB gun or a pellet gun or whatever. He, they can't come on your property. You're redeemed. The devil could not touch the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt because they had the blood on the doorpost of their home. It could not come in. If you're going through what you would now consider to be a spiritual battle in your home, in your family, in your business, or in your physical body, with your finances, or even in your mind, it could be just a, a spirit of depression. It could be a, all kinds of things that the enemy uses to try to defeat Christians. What I want you to do in a moment, if that's you, I want you to stand because Paul said, having done all to stand, to stand, therefore. And when you stand, I want you to get up behind that shield of faith. And we're going to take authority over this with you. If that's you, and there'll be many of you, and you're in a spiritual battle, and tonight you want to stand behind the shield of faith, just stand to your feet all across this building. Let people stand. If you're saying, I'm standing on this issue right now, tonight I'm standing. What a blessing. What a blessing. Now remember that shield is up in front of you. So just hold your hand up and hold that shield up. And I'm going to take authority with Pastor Rick and the other pastors here. We're going to take authority, first of all, over anything that hates New Life Church. Father, right now, we thank you for New Life Church. We speak a blessing. Come on, help me right now and pray. Uh, over all 17 campuses, we come against the demonic spirits over this state that hate this church, hate the leadership. We come against every demonic power. Satan, you know you're defeated. You know you were defeated. I bind you out of the physical bodies of the people in this room. <laughs> Issues of sicknesses and illnesses and, and chronic sicknesses. In Jesus' name, we take authority over you. And you must leave right now. Get out of their family. And I bind you off of marriages. I bind you away from their children. I bind you away from their business and their livelihood and their finances. I bind you even away from their mind. Every attack of depression, discouragement, a sense of failure in their mind that they don't even want to get out of bed. Satan, be gone in the name of Jesus Christ. Now you do it with me. You out of your mouth begin to tell the enemy. The Bible says resist the devil. And he will flee. Yeah, out of your mouth, you men, rise up with like I do with my family and tell the devil to get out of your family. He cannot hold your family. You are blessed with the blessing of God. You are in Christ. And Father God, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the victory. We praise you. Let's begin to praise God now. Out loud, just begin to praise God. Thank you. Come on, new life. Let's really give God mighty praise. We're talking about victory in the kingdom of God. We're talking about the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Come on, keep on going. Give God a mighty shout of praise. Thank you.
you, Lord, for the breakthrough in this church in 2019. Thank you, Lord, for a double portion year financially and spiritually, and we give you glory in Jesus' mighty name. You know what? You ought to do that one more time just to let the devil know. Woo! God bless you guys. Let's give God all the praise.